Hello, everyone, and welcome to this panel for Medium Digital Edition 2020. Uh, we are going to discuss what's next for live music industry. So as the COVID epidemic, a pandemic went on, all live music activity was shut down, concerts, halls, and festivals closed, postponed or canceled. So it's a huge loss for the business, from artists to booking agencies, management, venues, and festival, and all the companies that work around this business, including technicians, security agents, transportation, catering, etc. So according to the regions of the world, uh, the different way the countries have been hit and the different measures the governments have chosen to apply, populations have been locked down for around two months, and some are still stuck at home today. So the way the live music agendas have been managed has included incertitude and disagreement over the decision to be taken and the pace at which it should have been taken. Know that the pandemic seems to slow down a bit in some regions of the world. Some countries are beginning to think about how to reopen economies, but the live music industry is not the easiest to deal with. Of course, in one hand, thinking about distancing measures is better than nothing. But on the other hand, it seems totally opposite to the essence of live music and also difficult to, to deal with economically. Hence, some are choosing to still remain closed for the time being. All in all, live music production was reduced to live streaming at best without mentioning the drive-in shows. But there's also been the Travis Scott versus Fortnite events and a lot of ideas emerged from the past two months. It accelerated a lot of the tech aspects of the industry, even if more questions than answers remain, including an economic viability of all this. Anyway, everybody tries to adapt, as Medem totally did when it courageously chose to switch this year's edition on a totally digital entry event, starting from 2nd of June till Friday the 5th. So here we are, all in this panel, spanning all the time zones of the world all at once. So thanks to all the speakers to attend this webinar. I hope you all been safe during the past weeks. And I'm going to introduce everybody asking each participant to briefly present her or himself and her or his activities. So around us, from west to east on planet Earth, we have Alejandra Rubalcava Mora, event coordinator at OCESA in, in Mexico, Russ Tannen, chief revenue officer of DICE in the UK, Mike Malak, agent at CODA in the UK, Cyril Bachev, founder and promoter of Octopus in France, and Guillaume de Maquillet, Head of Music of Wonderful Festival, Wonderful, sorry, Festival in Thailand. And by the way, I'm called Olivier Pellerin. I'm a consultant and journalist, and I'm really happy to moderate this, this panel. So I'm going, I'm going to let you introduce shortly who you are and what you do, and also at the same time, maybe what impact COVID had on your activities. So beginning with you, Alejandra, if you, if you please. Hi, thank you so much for having me here. Um, I'm Alejandra, I work at Ostesa in Mexico. We're the biggest promoter in Latin America. Um, I mostly, I'm a talent buyer. I mostly focus on um, festivals. We have over 30 festivals. Um, and of course, just like everyone else here, this pandemic really, um, it hit us really hard. We were only able to have two festivals this year. One of them was EDC Mexico. And the other one is Vive Latino, which is um, the biggest Latin festival in um, Latin America. Uh, we were actually one week away from another one of our biggest festivals called Pal Norte in Monterrey. So that was a very big um, loss for the company money-wise. Um, we had to push everything to the second semester of the year. And now we're just starting to have those conversations of what next, are we able to move forward with um, the festivals or are we just pushing everything to 2021? Okay, uh, Russ. Hi, I'm Russ. I'm the Chief Revenue Officer at DICE. Um, up to a couple of months ago, uh, DICE was the world leading uh, mobile um, ticketing company. So working with people from Kanye West to River of Sounds um, and, and lots in between. Uh, we've been doing that for the last six years now um, and in the last two months we, we pivoted the business uh, to focus on being the, the place to discover and attend a quality live streamed events so excited to uh, explore that a bit more during the panel. Okay thank you Mike. 
Hey, I'm Mike. I'm from, uh, I work at Paradigm Agency in London. Um, I'm an agent over there. I've been there about nine years, um, looking after acts from Billie Eilish, Denzel Curry, um, Alec Benjamin, Normani, etc. Um, I also a and uh, on the side at Polydor Records in the UK. Um, and then I guess the, well, the impact, I mean, I guess the impact's pretty obvious, you know, on our side. I mean, it's obviously, we're, we're moving everything that we've had in this year to next year. Um, you know, we make most of our money in summertime. So obviously all the festivals being taken out, that's, that's, give it, that's kind of been a, a really, really big hit. Um, and yeah, we're just, we're just trying to basically build into next year. I mean, everything, honestly, everything that I have personally is being moved as far away as possible. So hopefully, you know, anything meaningful is starting in March, April next year on my side. Okay, thanks. Guillaume? Um, hi guys, thanks for having me. Um, my name is Guillaume de Maquier. People call me G, um, maybe because Guillaume is a, a little bit difficult to say for most people. <laughs> um, I've been in uh, Socialist Asia for like 10 years. Um, I've done many different things. I've been uh, focusing most of my time uh, promoting festivals in the region these last uh, three to five years. Uh, and I'm now the head of music of Wonderfruit Festival. Um, I don't know if you guys know it. Uh, do you guys know it? Can you make a sign if you know it? Yeah, you heard about it? Cool, okay, nice. Um, a few years ago, nobody knew it, so I'm happy to see that people have heard about it. Um, yeah, it's a beautiful festival happening in Thailand in December. Uh, we're probably the biggest festival of this kind in the region now. And um, yeah, that's it. I've, uh, and the impact for me, um, um, well, when, when you do all the bookings, obviously uh, your job changes a little bit when you can't do any more bookings. Uh, so um, maybe I can talk about it later, but we, we kind of uh, reinvented ourselves, creating new uh, ways to, um, to create experiences online. So yeah, the impact was actually quite interesting, uh, reinventing yourself. Okay, cool. I think we're, we're going to, to talk about this during the talk. Uh, thank you, Guillaume and Cyril, finally. Yes, happy to be here too. Um, I actually set up a, a, a bouquet agency based in Paris and uh, also a promoter in Paris uh, called Octopus. And we deal uh, with artists such as uh, Stormzy, Regis Snow, Waste Blood, and a few other French bands um, working internationally with them. Uh, and we also promote a few festivals, like boutique festivals, I would say, which is maybe a solution we might be able to talk about later on. Um, and I'm also booking a few other festivals, uh, kind of, uh, well, let's say 6,000 a day, uh, 6,000 people a day, festivals like Chorus or, or a few others in France. So, um, yeah, basically the uh, impact on COVID was uh, kind of uh, really tough for us. We had like more than 200 cancellations so far, three festivals cancellations too. So it's kind of, uh, I would say we, I mean, I don't know, but it's, it's like something like 80% or maybe 90% of our revenues, which has, which have totally disappeared in, uh, let's say two or three months. So, well, like, uh, like Mike, I would say we're actually starting to focus on 2021, not, not before. Uh, I, I wouldn't say it's optimistic. I wouldn't be optimistic about starting again before. So, but we still have plenty of ideas, which is, which is uh, interesting. Okay, thank you. So maybe uh, I'm going to begin with you, Guillaume, because if the festival is in December, does that mean that this year edition is going to take place like it was supposed to in December? So right now, I mean, first um, Asia, I think Asia in general, so Asia is a little bit big, but generally Asia is doing a little bit better uh, in terms of um, epidemic. Um, uh, the um, I'm, I'm now uh, in Thailand and we didn't have any, um, we're not locked down here. Uh, so the situation has been a little bit different. And, um, and while we were a little bit pessimistic on having the edition in, in December, right now we're slightly more optimistic. So we're, um, there's obviously no... Oh. Um, long-term visibility on the situation we cannot write yes yeah it's all right it's all right yeah. so Sorry. can you 
Okay. Yeah, yeah. So there's a so, so we hope it's going to happen. Um, and uh, we're focusing on our F, our efforts on um, on new um, new projects. Um, uh, so I'm um, I'm launching actually today. I was kickstarting a new online uh, the production of a new online show, um, and we've been um, we've been producing other shows as well uh, on a weekly basis that are called Fruitful. It's more related to food, so we have uh, food delivery happening in Bangkok, and on and uh, the night of the event there's a streaming happening. So there's a uh, content that is. Uh, also, there's an online show that is happening for all the participants of uh, of this event. So we do this on a weekly basis. Um, yeah. um, and I, uh, I'm also uh, I just launched last weekend United We Stream Asia. Um, so uh, challenging. Um, it's challenging. Things are again. Asia is different. Um, last weekend we had shows in Vietnam. We had shows in Hong Kong. Uh, meaning that uh, live music venues or clubs are opening. Um, so um, uh, things are, they, are... Are they opening uh, in the same conditions as before? Uh, yes, they are. Yes. Uh, you may have heard of a um, um, challenging opening in Korea uh, that happened maybe two, three weeks ago. Um, so they opened it and unfortunately there was like... Um, uh, someone tested positive and that was uh, going to a club in Korea. So not very good for the, uh, for the reputation of the nightlife, I would say. Um, but uh, yeah, things are basically there's here. We're in the process of starting again already. And, um, and many, many countries in, in Southeast Asia didn't have a lockdown. So I haven't experienced a lockdown personally. So, um, uh, so the, if, if for most of the world, uh, 2020 looks challenging. Uh, on our side, um, we're basically waiting to see how it's going to evolve. Um, I think all of us, we, we know that uh, we're not afraid of the first wave, but of the second wave, third wave, what's going to happen? So much inertia in the propagation of the epidemic, so no visibility. So it's hard to say. Um, I, I have some discussions with festival uh, promoters in Australia, in Asia, um, some are, they have green light for November. Um, so you also have uh, this kind of, um, a lot of discussions about uh, the Fuji Rock Festival, right? In Japan um, for August. Um, so um, yeah, Asia looks, uh, let's say that it looks slightly positive. Now, um, the real risk is about um, spending a lot of money on an event that end up being canceled last minute. Um, so there's ways to protect yourself from that. Um, one, the safe way that we're hearing is uh, maybe to focus more on the, reg on the region or locally. So basically a way to uh, have as minimum money out as possible. Um, that's one way to protect yourself. But right now, um, yeah, right now we have to wait, wait and see. And hopefully we can go ahead. Okay, thanks. Uh, maybe Alejandra on the other side of the world. Uh, we know that for the time being, uh, South America is uh, has a difficult situation with uh, with the pandemic. So, how how is your point of view of uh, the way you're going to be able to go back to not maybe not normal, but to, how do you hope reopening your activities? Uh, well, we're not seeing the light at the end of the tunnel anytime soon. Uh, we've been on lockdown since March 16th. Um, and according to the government, we haven't reached the peak yet. So uh, we don't even know when we're going to go back to our office, let alone um, be able to um, start planning um, events with over a thousand people. Um, the biggest concern for us is artists touring. There are, I mean, we book a lot of international acts and the ones that we've been in touch with have already, like Mike said, they've, all, they've pushed their plans to 2021. So even if we are to start talking about having a festival sometime in the second semester, um, artists aren't going to be touring. So um, we are talking about doing, um, local um, festivals with local acts 
Um, but we just have to wait and see um, how things move, well, how, how the government and everything just keeps on moving forward and how things develop. Um, yeah, it's, to be honest, we're, we're, we're gonna start focusing on 2021 soon and just start leaving everything for the second semester um, aside. Okay, thanks. Uh, same question, Mike. Uh, how do you, 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 you already told that you're focusing on 2021? Oh no, yeah, 2021, but how do you see, uh, do you see it more precisely? How will it begin again? Um, yeah, I mean, so we are, we're moving everything to 2021. Um, I think, I think everybody's hope is that, you know, at the end of, it's like towards the tail end of this year, we're going to be able to do some events, like small rooms, 50 cap, 100 cap, 200 cap, like that's, I think that's what we're hoping for. And I think, you know, hopefully, hopefully, if and when that happens, we can be flexible, and we can kind of put on some really great shows. But as Alejandro was saying, I mean, I think, I think in most markets, it's going to be local tours for a bit, you know, it's going to be in the UK, it's going to be a lot of UK artists and so on and so forth. But I, I, I think I think the big, the other big thing is just like travel restrictions, you know, we're all we're all concerned about all these countries are doing things at their own pace and opening up at different rates. And we'll see, you know, God forbid, if there's a second wave and all that, but um, you know, we have to be conscious of that too. Cause it's like, I, I don't, I can't really bring an artist. Sorry about that. Oh my God. Um, I can't really bring an artist over from, um, from the States without, um, without working that out, you know, like, I, I don't think they'll be able to go to all those territories um, if they can't, like, if they're not going to be able to travel comfortably, then that's going to be a big issue. So I think to answer your question, I think end of the year, hopefully smaller shows, but that's like a bonus at this point. And then uh, March onwards will be uh, the bigger stuff, I think. Fingers crossed. Okay, thanks. Cyril, in France, is it the same? Uh, yeah, same here. Um, we need to focus on the French artists uh, touring in France, or maybe European artists, let's be optimistic, European artists coming over to France and, and be able to uh, present and introduce their, their shows. But um, yeah, definitely... The, the main focus will be French artists anyway. And uh, this is why like really tiny rooms and tiny festivals will have a chance to, uh, to take place and, and, and meet a public an audience. So um, this is, well, let's say, let's hope that COVID or any pandemic will just disappear in a few months, but that's in a way, it's probably a future. I mean, uh, focusing on, on really tiny events Tiny means like less than I would say five thousand people, and 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 work on local, local artists, local public, local audience, local subsidiaries too, and uh, and and I hope yeah that's to me that's the future. It was already I mean that was a trend that was actually starting before the COVID to me, and I think it's gonna. We, we will have like an acceleration of this uh, of this trend after this uh, crisis. Okay, thanks. And before uh, going to you, Russ, because I think we're going to to speak about live streaming and and the the the, the role it, it took and is going to take soon. But you all focused on the local scene that's going to be more important than it was before. So does this also mean that it's going to reduce your cost and maybe also that there are going to be a slowdown of the, of the money you pay for artists and of the fees because there will be more less international demand. So maybe the, the fees are going to slow down. Anyone wants to answer this one? Yeah, I, I'd like to talk a little bit about that. I think, um, I mean, I work with agents that's that's pretty much all I do um, I talk to them constantly and I think it's going to be really interesting um, to see how deals are negotiated moving forward um, and by that I mean that it's clear that we're not going to be able to pay um, the guarantees that we were before the pandemic um, since the world is currently facing an economic crisis um, 
we're going to be competing as promoters. Uh, we're going to be competing with a lot of other industries. So we're going to have to be really careful about how we start pricing tickets. Um, and so I think that once we go back um, to normal, if that's even, if that even exists anymore, um, then I don't think we're going to be seeing these huge production tours um, for a while. So, um, so yeah, I don't know if that answers the question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think that we're maybe entering a, an era of small is beautiful. I don't know, but for the time being, we have no choice, actually. Russ, um, is the pivot uh, that DICE did from um, mobile ticketing to a uh, kind of a live stream platform, is it uh, definitive or are you planning then to mix both medias when it will be possible? Yeah, I think just to, I guess to take one step back from that, from our side, um, we're, our, our main markets are the UK, the US, France, Spain, and Italy. So we really uh, definitely see, saw the effect of lockdown in, in everywhere that we are and all of our partners, including Cyril. Um, we all saw the impacts um, straight away. So um, what, what we did initially was just to start um, a series of like uh, summits, basically calls between all our partners. And we've really been trying to offer as much practical advice for our venue festival promoter and artists um, partners to make it through this period and start to think about um, planning from the other side. So navigating all of the different financial schemes and everything like that um, in each country and just trying to be as helpful as we can. Um, I think the interesting thing that's happened with live streaming is that we did a quick project on it in the first sort of couple of weeks of lockdown, we had an event come through in the US that um, raised 300,000, almost $300,000 in donations, which made us see that actually there was a value on the live stream. Even though it was donations, we just thought actually there, um, there was a clear sign from fans that they would be willing to, to pay for it. And although there was kind of thousands of events come through um, that were kind of free and very low quality, we saw a quick shift and we've seen a quick shift in the last sort of three or four weeks to to paid events and I think one of the exciting things for our venue partners and promoter partners is the move um, of those uh, live stream events from sort of very low quality at people's homes to high quality productions taking place in venues um, and, and looking more like a traditional show. Um, and what, what's been fascinating for us is really uh, not just the demand um, from the fans or the quality on the supply side but the actual um, emotional quality of the experience of watching the live stream, especially for the events that have been paid. So what we're seeing is that when fans are paying uh, to watch the live stream, they're really planning their week or their night around that as an event um, in the same way that we see with sports. And we really think that longer term, uh, live music is gonna look a lot more like sports where the best experience is to be there in the stadium watching the game. The second best experience is probably in the pub with your friends watching on the screen. But there's another third experience, which is actually sat at home. All of those experiences you pay for. Um, and we think that there is, to your original question, a, a hybrid model that actually takes us through um, into, into next year and beyond that is an extra ticket type on every event. Um, you can imagine uh, if you know, the strokes of playing Madison Square Garden, how many people would want to play that show or any artist playing their hometown or that the headline date, the hometown headline date of the tour is the, the date that people want to see. So although a lot of this conversation has been around how touring looks like it's going to be, or shows look like they're going to be very local, what we're seeing is an incredible global impact of the lockdown because of live streaming um, and, and we've seen people buying tickets in 113 different countries um, for events. We saw people um, on Saturday night, we had an event with uh, David Guetta playing on the roof of the Rockefeller Center with the Empire State Building lit up behind him. Um, and we saw people buying tickets for that all over the world. Um, they could buy tickets to be on screens in front of him so that it, they could interact with him during the event. Um, we're seeing artists doing tours where they're geo-targeting the tickets for different dates. So um, some artists are planning 30-date live stream tours where they're going to play them all from, you know, the same place, but they're going to they're time zone those, those events and, and target them very 
specifically for the audience they want to reach. So we're seeing this incredible amount of innovation. Um, I think we're, we're actually also starting to see um, what, what, what's becoming like a significant amount of revenue for artists and their teams as well. So I think that, you know, there's obviously going to be, and I agree with everyone that 2020 doesn't look like there's going to be a lot of events happening. Like Mike said, end of the year, maybe some smaller shows would be amazing um, to get some of our venues open. Um, but really 2021 looks like when live shows are going to take place. So I think if we can create something awesome, create amazing experiences for fans that happen in a live stream um, context or a live stream medium, then that's where, that's where we should be kind of focusing our energies right now. And that's, that's where we are. But um, maybe a, maybe a, a, te a temporary um, full focus for DICE and then maybe longer term, it's going to be this hybrid model, yeah. So maybe it's for relocating the production, but broadcasting worldwide. Is, I, I saw you both, Mike and Guillaume, nod to what uh, Russ was saying. Do you think I, that I, this I, I hybrid uh, model is going to like settle for a while? Yeah, I have, I have a lot of things. Oh, you, sorry, you want to go first? Oh, go, go ahead, go ahead. Um, okay, um, so um, I would say that, um, that uh, the technology to do this was already available before and the sport industry tried with VR to uh, allow people to watch um, sport events with this technology and it didn't really work. Um, and I personally, I believe that um, that there are some opportunities to be taken uh, for virtual event. But, um, but what would make a virtual event a quality event is not trying to feel like you are there while you're not there, which is basically a, an experience that is not as good as being there. I think it's more about finding what more we can do in the virtual environment. And, um, and the, the one simple example, and I think you were mentioning it, it is, the, is the concept of uh, Travis Scott, right? Um, this was developed before COVID. And, and it was a massive success. It's not a massive success because it was made during COVID. It's a massive success because it was real innovation that was um, based on um, uh, using um, yeah, using what the new environment can, can create and create more quality. So uh, if you're, you know, what, what the question to ask is, is what would a virtual event, uh, why would it be better than a physical event? That's the question we should ask ourselves. And, and, and the answer can be that anyone from all around the world can be there at the same time. You cannot do this with a physical event. Uh, it can be that uh, you can create augmented reality. You can create um, virtual reality. You can create, you can navigate in an environment with like, I don't know, new ways, like what you do in a, in a, in a video game. So um, right now, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm also involved in, in, in many events with streaming and I think today in the COVID situation, uh, the streaming is a good replacement. Uh, now, is it going to thrive? I think yes, with the condition that this content is better than the physical one. Okay, so it, it lets some time to, to develop and to match. Sorry, I was the, too long, sorry. sorry. The no, 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 I, think no, I was no, excited, no, I was excited. No, 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 it's good. I, I was just saying that it may be, takes, it will maybe take some time to match the physical condition of a show uh, in, in a good live stream. And maybe also it's going to be like expensive for some smaller producers. So maybe there's going to have two, 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 two channels of productions that the, the gap will be more and more important between small productions and, and big productions. Mike, you, you wanted to say something on that? On, on the, yeah, the, I mean, the... I, I listen. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of the technology. I think, I think there's a long, there's a long way to go. We're all trying to figure out like what the right path is and how it all works. But I don't, I don't, I don't think that st live streaming is just here for now. I think it's, I think it's a permanent thing, and I think it's, um, I think it's a really exciting thing. It's going to open doors for all of us to hopefully make more money. And God forbid if, you know, if this ever happened again, I'd like to know that I could go to Dice and I could put on a tour and I could still make money and, you know, we can keep things going. So that, that to me is like super exciting. And I think it's something that as agents and promoters, we have to, we have to figure out and we have to understand all the different, different technologies as much as we understand how to cut a deal, you know? And that is, that is just, that's just a fact of it. If you don't, if you don't learn it at this point, 
then you're definitely going to get left behind and some of the dinosaurs are just going to get left behind but that's just part of part of growth isn't it Cyril? yeah well, i totally agree with the with mike here uh as soon as the ecosystem the whole ecosystem is uh concerned or uh respected then then everyone will be happy about it about this new technology and this new way of uh of uh watching a concert it's it's uh, watching or attending a concert uh the ecosystem is uh managers booking agents promoters everyone was involved in the concert and it's not only an artist which is the main fo i mean this is what we need to focus on now cut a deal as mike said uh, i totally agree with this i think i think the way we should all be thinking about it is really like how much bigger the audience can potentially be for every show going forward imagine if every Premier League football game, the only people who got to see it were the people that got tickets for the match. Like that's, that's what we're doing with music at the moment. And I think that um, this, this um, sort of forced adoption by lots of um, artists and fans during this time is what's going to create the long, the long sort of um, tale of this, that, that it is going to last a long time because people are going to go through this moment together where we're all going to kind of get used to watching a couple of concerts at home. Um, and then we're going to realize that actually for some concerts, it's just easier um, to, to sit at home. And if, if, if the, um, you know, especially, the, you know, the, with, with live streaming, there's so many less factors. If you actually think about going to a gig, all of the different things that have to, you have to be able to get to, you have to live near it. You have to be able to get to it. You have to be able to afford it. You have to have people to go with. It's actually quite complicated when you break it down. Um, so actually to open up the audience to all the people that for whatever reason can't make it to that show, but for them to still be able to experience it, I think is a, a huge shift for the industry and um, definitely feels like an exciting birth of something new at the moment. Um, I have a question actually more for, for um, yeah, booking agents. Um, if you concentrate all your, if, if you open this show to the world, then would you limit this gig to a single gig or would you still be touring? It just, uh, Travis Scott did five Fortnite gigs while the previous one in Fortnite by DJ Marshmello was only one. So Marshmello had something like 10 million audience. And because Travis Scott they replicated the concert five times, it, I think it reached more than 30 million of people of Fortnite player watching it. So maybe it adds to and, this question. And, and the idea of geolocalizing, geo sorry if it's not the right word, but uh, any gig is any streaming is uh, totally an opportunity we need to focus on too. I mean, if you do like a tour in the US and just you know open uh, the live streaming to the US uh, citizens, then you know it's fine and, and you do a tour this way. So it can be really interesting then. Yeah, Alejandra, you want to? Um, yeah, do, no. Do, 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 did you already add some um, uh, live streaming experience with you on, on your gigs? before we just had our first virtual festival this weekend um and that was that was really interesting um obviously this is all very news for everyone at the company um so it was a two-day festival it was one day of pop and one day of rock um it was all local bands well latin bands um and we didn't do well during the pop day but during the rock day which was the second day um, we had over 22,000 people watching, um, and we got really excited. I mean, the number doesn't sound that big, um, but that was very exciting for us. And I mean, we learned so much from it and now, and we realized that, well, maybe this is what the Mexican public, it was geo-targeted to Mexico. And we realized that maybe this is what the Mexican public wants. They want to see more rock acts. Um, I mean, we took down a lot of notes from it and we're learning. We obviously want to have a second edition with international bands now. And like I said, just geo-targeting it to Mexico. Yeah, and Mexico is known in the music industry to be one of the most uh, interesting people streaming-wise because there's a lot of streaming activity in Mexico. So maybe this COVID crisis is bringing streaming into the live music industry. Yeah, this is definitely not going to go away. Um, I think we're just going to get better at it. We're going to innovate and um, we're learning. We're, we're, we're still learning. And so do you, do you see like if we 
try to forget this crisis and try to go forward in 2020, 21, sorry. Uh, do you all think that we're going to go back to a normal or the old normal doesn't exist anymore? Russ? Everything's going to be different. Everything's going to be a bit different. I don't know if that's going to be that we get back to, you know, the same place we were in terms of obviously live events and festivals and everything just feeling great. But then there's this addition of a live streaming pace of live streaming element. That's like the new, maybe that's going to be the, the legacy of it. Maybe there's going to be other things like um, that, that come about, but I think for now that that seems like the most likely. Um, and yeah, you know, everyone, we, I'm sure we're all here, like we all can't wait to feel um, safe to, to put on amazing events and, and go and attend amazing events and, and concerts and festivals and club nights and the rest of it again. Like we, um, yeah, we, we can't wait for that. Um, to happen. Mike? Yeah, um, I mean, I think, I think it is going to be different for sure. I, I think, I think, you know, so I don't know about other people, but when I hear the word different, sometimes it scares me a bit because I feel like it makes it sound like it's going to be completely different. I think it's just more like a period of like adjustment, you know, and we're all, like I said, we're all learning about the different technologies. I think they're going to be implemented in, in the way that we do business. Um, and then I think there's still a period of adjustment, I guess, in terms of how artists travel and, you know, the effect that this has had as well, just on, um, you know, the environment and everything like that and what people are going to think about that and how that affects, you know, how much touring they want to do and all that kind of stuff. So there is, there's all the, this kind of stuff that we have to work through, but at the end of the day, you know, and also the economic crisis, but, you know, about the economic crisis, like I think, I think, you know, live music is something where people always want to go to, to a show. And, you know, even when they don't have a lot of money, most of the times they buy a ticket for something because it's kind of their release and they want to get away from something. Um, so I feel, I feel confident about it bouncing back, but I think it's going to bounce back in a slightly different way. Okay, so saying all that you're saying uh, with the live streaming and the fact that international uh, travels are going to be more difficult, would you consider to push things forward, some shows where you could have different stages in different countries for the same show? Um, what do you mean? Like you have a festival with a stage in France, a stage in the UK and a stage in the Canada. Oh, you mean as a, as a live stream event? Yeah mix of the, 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 the three stage are, are, are live physically in real life, but are also uh, united for a sort of live streaming fest event. I mean, I don't, I don't know. I don't know how that works financially for the promoter though. That's the only, that's the only thing if I'm understanding that correctly. But um, yeah, I mean, listen, I think there's, there's lots of ways of doing stuff. Like obviously the God dice and you know, lots of other people are, and all of us are start starting to do some things just to get things going. And also thinking about artists that are in cycle and they're releasing albums. And, you know, we have tours that we're holding for like, that are like a year or a year and a half away. You know, we need to, we need to do something to kind of um, keep fans engaged and, and it has to make sense. Like it can't be forced and it can't just be, just do a live stream, just to do a live stream. So, you know, I think it's, it's partly like understanding the audience and what works for that artist and, you know, trying to find solutions that are case by case. Like it's not, it's not one solution fits all, you know? Cyril, I saw you. Yeah, well, as long as the production is uh, interesting, I'd, I'd say we have a future with the streaming now. Uh, if we keep only doing like normal live stream in your bedroom or even in a club, empty club, then I don't really see any future. But if you, you know, if you work on the production side, then it can really be interesting. And, and yes, I would totally agree with what you were actually asking to Mike. Uh, you could uh, plan like, um, like a different gig in five, well, at the same time in, in five different uh, continents, which is quite amazing, I think with like maybe different languages or different, well, just the, uh, the, uh, the way the, the, the stage is actually uh, uh, watched and, and broadcasted could be different. And that can be interesting for, for a band or an artist to, uh, to emerge or even to, uh, to be watched. 
Okay, so maybe to, to conclude, um, would you say that with everything that happened and in obviously some bad conditions and with the, with the pandemic, would you say for 2021 and on, you're rather optimistic or pessimistic? Alejandra? I'm optimistic. Um, like we just said, uh, virtual festivals and concerts are not going to go away. I think we're just going to learn how to make them better, how to give the public what they want, how to um, give the public their money's worth because as promoters, we're going to have to eventually start um, charging for these events. We can't just keep, make, if we want to make money, uh, we can't just um, keep live streaming them for free. Um, so it's optimistic in the sense that we're going to get better at live streams. And I am optimistic that touring is going to come back, that live touring. And that's, I mean, at the end of the day, there's nothing like being at a concert, at a festival, at a show, you know, the, I mean, yeah. Okay, yeah, thanks. Well, we've been so slowered down, I would say, but uh, it's also an opportunity to move forward even more than what we were uh, three or four months ago. So, yeah, I would say uh, I'd be really optimistic about the experience um, a festival or a concert goer uh, can uh, live when he goes to a concert. So, or even if he stays in his living room. So, yeah, pretty much uh, optimistic. You? Always optimistic. <laughs> Um, I mean, yeah, um, the, um, um, Asia appeared on the map of touring quite recently. Uh, so, um, live music and, and touring and big festivals is actually something quite new in the region. And, and so, um, today we are really, um, the, the, the new up and coming artists are, are growing today. And, um, and because it's a young industry it's also fragile so um for us there's um uh, we're there's a concern it's re we really have to save what we've developed this last decade because we started with not much and now we really reach a really incredible level not only in terms of production events but also in terms of talents and so we have to save this and for i think for me this is the priority and 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 wonder fruit and other festivals are going to happen 2021 no problem 2020 in the region we could happen already, but um, but now a lot of musicians are out of job, a lot of uh, professional in the in the industry are out of job, and this is concerning. We have to save the industry that way, so it keeps growing. Russ, yeah, de definitely optimistic, and um, you know I, I was at uh, Medem last year, you know, in Cannes, and at the end of the panel did encourage like it was a very young crowd, and you know wondering you know what the audience will be like for this today but I would encourage people just like I did then if they're young and they're thinking about working in uh, the music industry that putting on an event um, is an amazing way to start and if and if someone's watching this and thinking about wow this must be a hard time to get started in the music industry I'd still encourage people to think creatively and, and create something themselves so whether that is in the short term um, curating some type of live streaming festival I think it's an amazing time to to start a project like that um, or just thinking ahead to the end of the year and, and next year starting to thinking about putting on small shows um, I do I do think it's an amazing way to get started in the business um, the broader music industry is, is becoming a promoter and, and doing that so um, yeah very optimistic and optimistic for people just getting started as well and finally Mike yeah, I mean, I'm, I am very optimistic. I think, I think it's, uh, it's definitely, it's, it's, it is, and it I probably will continue for a little bit to be a difficult year. We're all losing money, you know, it's, it's, um, it's definitely tough, but I think, I think it's great. Like if I, I, I keep thinking like if we can look back in three, four years time and we have more revenue streams, you know, doors open and other ways of doing this kind of stuff. And if I, if I could just know in three, four years time that God forbid, if this happened again, there'd still be some way of making some money that makes me feel a lot better. So, I, and I think we can get to that point, but it's just, it's a process that we all have to go through and it's, um, you know, it's not going to be easy, but we'll, we'll get through that process and, and learn quickly, hopefully. Okay. So we came to the end of this, of this talk. So I hope we, 
like build some optimism for everybody and that we are going to be able to to build from this crisis on on new new models and to make them like sustainable so thanks to all you guys and girls and see you at the next meeting <laughs> thanks. thanks thanks guys thank, thank you. you thank you